Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2023 Silber Obrecht Lecture presented by the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies, also known as ICJS. I am Heather Miller Rubens, the Executive Director and Roman Catholic Scholar here at ICJS. Um, in addition to welcoming our guests in the room today with us at Loyola University, Maryland, I want to extend my welcome to viewers from around the world watching via YouTube. This afternoon is the second lecture of our two-night series of endowed academic lectures to advance the emerging field of interreligious and interfaith studies. A little bit more about the lecture. The Silver Obrecht Lecture is a series of endowed academic lectures intended to advance the field of emerging uh, the emerging field of interreligious and interfaith studies. The development of this field is an indication of the growing understanding in societies as well as among scholars that there are many possible responses to the realities of religious pluralism, theological, philosophical, historical, scriptural, ethical, legal, praxeological, and institutional. And these responses to religious pluralism need thoughtful and reasoned inquiry. Because of this need, ICJS is honored to create the first endowed lecture focused on advancing the questions that are shaping this field of inquiry. This year's inaugural Silver Obrecht Lecture marks the beginning, indeed the foundation, for what ICJS expects to be a distinguished series of academic lectures here in Baltimore to advance the field of interreligious and interfaith studies. Although ICJS funds and manages the lectureship, we could not do this work without our partners from five esteemed Baltimore academic institutions. Goucher College, the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University, Loyola University, Maryland, Morgan State University's Center for Religion and Cities, and St. Mary's Seminary and University. I want to particularly thank Loyola University, Maryland for hosting the inaugural lecture this year. Future Silber Obrecht lectures will happen biannually and the hosting location will rotate among our program partners here in Baltimore. We look forward to inviting you to the next lectures in 2025. The lecture series is named in honor of Sidney and Jean Silber and Charles and Margaret Obrecht in recognition of their longtime commitment to improving interreligious relationships and understanding. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to let you know that following tonight's lecture, we will have a question and answer session. All viewers, both those here in the room and online via YouTube, can ask questions using the online tool Slido. On the screen now are instructions for how you can access this Q&A tool. You do not need to download the app. You just need to go to any browser and go to slido.com. When you see the message that asks if you're joining as a participant, type in our event code for, to, for today, which is 303-4530. Then type your question into the open box on the screen. You can submit a question at any time during the lecture. In Slido, all members of the audience will be able to see questions asked by other audience members and even upvote questions that you'd like to see answered. At about 5 p.m., I will ask Professor Clooney to address as many questions as time allows. We'll have a short break at 5.20 of about 10 to 15 minutes for, for coffee um, and refreshment. And then we are delighted to hear from our respondent, Dr. Shuba Patach. After her presentation, we will again open up another Q&A session with both speakers and our audiences. And I would now like to introduce for a second time our esteemed speaker for this second lecture. Francis Clooney is the Parkman Professor of Divinity and Professor of Comparative Theology at Harvard. After earning his doctorate in South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago, he taught at Boston College for 21 years before joining the Harvard Divinity School faculty in 2005. From 2010 to 2017, he was the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard. Professor Clooney is a leading figure globally in comparative theology, a discipline distinguished by attentiveness to the dynamics of theological learning deepened through the study of traditions other than one's own. In his scholarship, Professor Clooney focuses on Sanskrit and Tamil theological commentary traditions and has recognized expertise in Catholic Hindu exchanges. He has written 22 books, including extensive writings on the Jesuit missionary traditions, particularly in India. On the early Jesuit Pan-Asian discourse on reincarnation, 
and on the dynamics of dialogue and interreligious learning in the contemporary world. He is currently the president of the Catholic Theological Society of America and a fellow of the British Academy, and most recently, an honorary doctorate was awarded to Professor Clooney by Regis College at the University of Toronto. He is a Roman Catholic priest and has been a member of the Society of Jesus for 50 years. He is currently working on an intellectual autobiography with a working title, Priest and Scholar, Catholic and Hindu, a love story. He serves regularly in a Catholic parish on weekends. It is my honor to introduce Frank Clooney as the inaugural Silver Obrecht Lecturer. His talk this afternoon is entitled, What is the Future of the Emerging Field of Interreligious and Interfaith Studies? Please join me in welcoming Professor Clooney. I would like to begin by uh, expressing my thanks again for everyone involved in arranging and making possible this lecture series. Thanks to you who were here last night and for the wonderful questions and um, sense of sharing the mission, sharing the work we are about. And I look forward also tonight to hearing your questions and comments. And I look also to hearing my learned respondent, Shubha Patak, and her thoughtful response later on. So let us begin. I would like to begin just by saying that I think last night my purpose was trying as hard as I could to rise to the challenge of this lecture series, the past, the present, and the future of interreligious and interfaith learning, which is by no means a small task. Um, as I said last night, I think the best we can do in reality is read the current moment in light of where it is coming from and in where it is going. And I will do that today, too. Instead of thinking prophetically or trying to sketch out a future that will be years in advance, to say, where are we and how can we go ahead with one particular angle and one particular question in terms of what can we do now to ensure that interfaith studies and interreligious studies in relation to interfaith studies are vigorous and alive in the generations to come. So let us try. Last night, as, as those of you who are here will recall, I started by referring to a number of volumes, uh, impressive handbooks and companions and journals that have been monitoring over the past decade or two decades or even more where we are in terms of the interreligious and the interfaith. And I think that serves as a consolidation, as I said last night, for where we are in this field. But any kind of consolidation becomes like the basis for something new. And I think the this consolidation we saw last night raises questions about how we read history, what we think is the message of our history, the good and the bad of our past, uh, disillusioning us, even if we find it difficult, of any confident sense of progress. Things are always getting better, maybe, maybe not. And yet a sense that we can, if we pay attention, understand the history of interfaith relations before us in order to understand where we are now. I stress also, looking at the different companions, how the very disciplines that we work with, that study the interreligious, that study the, inter, the religious traditions in themselves and their relationship to one another, are themselves in flux. Things are changing, disciplines are growing, some are declining, new fields are emerging. And for us to do the work of interfaith understanding, which I think is basic, we have to very much be part of a conversation that is interreligious studies as well. And I want to build on that tonight. And the final thing I think I would stress from last night was that the large themes that we play out according to the history of our disciplines, the history of our religious traditions and our communities, the nations and cultures in which the interreligious realities have, have flourished, is often and perhaps always played out in terms of who we are, our individual selves. The stories that bring us to a conversation like this this afternoon, the ways in which we care about interfaith and interreligious are also encoded very deeply in who I am, who you are. And by looking at our individual stories, I argued, we can begin to understand truly where we are going by realizing that all of this is taking place in ourselves as well. And as I said at the very end of my talk last night, 
uh, we also get older. Uh, if we look at ourselves, we realize we're getting older and therefore have to cu constantly cultivate new conversations between the generation that any of us happen to belong to and the younger generations that follow after us. And so all of that I take as background for tonight. What I would like to do today is, is focus on one particular question, that if, as I said last night, faith is central and faith is fundamental and the interfaith relationship is key, then I would like to ask the question and answer it very quickly, faith in what? And while it may sound incredibly trite, obvious, faith in God, I think, is actually essential to our understanding and our way of proceeding. That is simple to say, faith, faith in God, a robust, strong sense of God in different religious traditions, thinking about the meaning of God in different traditions, and not allowing the questions of God, you might say the vertical questions that open into the transcendent, to be erased or pushed to the side by the legitimate political, social, cultural questions that we live with every day. But in saying that, I'm also aware that there are great issues involved in how we think about the question of God. Um, for instance, we can use the word God. We can use the word God with a capital G. We can use it in the feminine form, goddess. We can use it in the plural, gods and goddesses. But I think because we're involved in interfaith, interreligious studies, we're very sensitive, as we need to be, that there are other terms that people prefer and they find it uneasy to use the word God. So to talk about uh, Brahman or moksha in the Indian traditions, to talk about nirvana, to talk about some kind of an ultimate reality that is beyond terminology, beyond the words we use. And I think on the one hand, we have to be respectful of one another's ways of proceeding. Uh, it is no sense that those of us who belong to theistic traditions of the East or the West, to simply say everybody is using God language, but neither can we say that simply using these words as cinnamon, synonyms of God, that is to say nirvana, brahman, moksha, and so on and so on, as if that makes no difference, because I think if we simply use these terms as alternative terms, we can actually weaken our discourse by saying God or whatever. Uh, the word God doesn't have any strength or power to it after some time. And what I'd like to argue tonight is that if we think more vigorously, more strongly, more deeply about what we are thinking about God, and I have one very particular example through translation of Tamil poetry of all things to get us into the question of God, we can begin to think about how can the interreligious and interfaith context in which we live actually give us a stronger and not weaker God language. Again, with deference to those who prefer not to use that terminology. So kind of a tricky thing of back and forth between the two realms. To understand this a little bit more, I would like to just quote the, on the urgency of raising the God question from the, the distinguished Protestant theologian of the last century, uh, writing in the 1980s, Wolfhard Pannenberg, a great German theologian. And in the first volume of his uh, systematic theology, he says this about the God question, an incisive question that must be reviewed, viewed with importance is the fading of the concept of God and the loss of the function of the God term for humanity and public consciousness in a culture that has become religiously indifferent. For the existence of God has not only become doubtful, but the very content of the concept of God has also become unclear. In the discussion of the word God, which introduces his foundations of Christian faith, the famous Catholic and Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner has said, this word God has become as enigmatic for us today as a blank face. And I think this came up last night in some of the questions. Many people, including perhaps many younger people, are not even sure what we mean when we use the word God. And therefore, we cannot avoid an interfaith in its religious studies to be thinking about this question. He goes on to say, it is not surprising that with other terms of the Christian vocabulary, the word God can seem even to theologians as a kind of embarrassment for a Christian proclamation because it prevents secular people from understanding what we are talking about. And yet he concludes by saying, if we can't talk about God, we can't talk about Christian faith. If we can't talk about Christian faith, we can't talk about Jesus Christ. 
And I would say analogously in other traditions, uh, both of the Jewish tradition, the Islamic tradition, theistic traditions of India, but more extensively other traditions, if we lose the power of some terminology related to the divine or the divine person with a capital P, then in a sense we begin to see the very foundations of our discipline and the conversations we want to have starting to dis uh, disintegrate and, and fall apart in our presence. I think also, and this will lead me into the substance of what I'd like to present to you tonight in the limited time I have, we do not get very far by simply talking about the word God. And this is not the place for a systematic theological conversation either. But if we talk about God and Allah or God and Nirvana or God and Brahman and so on, I think we, we are in danger of getting into kind of wordplay or a concern about how these words are used, simply as if dictionary words can be replaced by one another or put next to one another. And I don't think we make an advance. I don't think we really get anywhere in our conversation. And therefore, I think what I would propose to you, and this hopefully will make sense of what follows, is that God is part of a discourse, that we speak in certain ways in our different religious traditions. We carry forward certain conversations, there are great texts that are more philosophical, <clears throat> historical, mystical. There are texts of praise. Uh, there are texts of great questions. There are great stories in the Bible and the traditions of the East as well, <clears throat> in which the word God functions as a word within a discourse or within a language. And I think one of the problems we're facing today, although really not with a group like this that is caring about this conversation, is that we don't have enough thick description, thick understanding of each other's discourses of the divine to really be able to resonate with one another in using our God language. While we use the word God or don't use it out of courtesy, part of the reason may be that we don't know enough about the traditions to which we belong, sometimes our own, but also other traditions as well. And so in a kind of counterintuitive sense, that is the great gamble of this lecture tonight. I would like to go very particular from this very large question. Having raised the question of God in Western civilization and the very future of religion related to the question of God, what I would like to do is talk about something that I actually am working on, namely the translation of ninth century Tamil Hindu poetry from the south of India. And the reason I do this, and I'll, I'll get to this in a moment, um, in fact, I can put something up on the screen here. Maybe I can't. Oh, sorry, pressing the wrong button. OK. I'd like to dig into the medieval Tamil tradition of poetry, mystical poetry of the saints of South India, in order to say that in the particular work that you and I do, whether it happens to be as in my case, and I don't think anyone else in the room or online working with medieval Tamil poetry, deals with a certain kind of text, a certain kind of poetic text, mystical text, or by analogy, what are we actually doing? What are you actually doing? In the particularities of what we do, we can begin to find the resources in our own faith traditions for recovering what God language is about, but also by learning across boundaries we can learn about how to think about God, speak about God in a way to one another that has some power to it, but also is not disrespectful of people who use the term otherwise or don't really want to use it at all. And going deliberately very specific is to make the point that it's in the specifics in the particular that we make an advance in terms of what we do. I would just remind you as I launch into explaining what's on the screen there is that Tamil poetry of South India, ninth century, is something I have been studying on and off for over 40 years, uh, since 1980 or so, working on different texts. But I am not a South Indian Hindu. Um, I'm not a Hindu. I'm a Roman Catholic, Irish Catholic, New York, etc. And so I come to this tradition with great respect and great love over these 40 years. But I come to it not as a native of the tradition, but from outside it. And I think this, too, is important for what I'm saying tonight. One could spend a lot of time, I'm Roman Catholic, looking into the classic literature of the Roman Catholic tradition or the Christian mystical tradition more generally, 
or the great rabbinic Jewish tradition of mysticism or Islamic mysticism, you know, whatever traditions we may belong to. But the point of working with this other tradition is to argue that if we pay attention to what we're reading, it begins to resonate and open for us possibilities of knowing more and differently about God than we knew before. So what you see on the screen there, the 12 poet saints, the Alvars of Tamil India, approximately between the 7th and 10th century in South India, so Southeast India, what's called Tamil Nad, the land of the Tamil people, the Tamil language. In that period, the 7th to 10th century or so, there were 12 saints known as the Alvars. And while the term Alvar is d disputed, what does that word mean? It seems to mean something for most people is related to being immersed or those who have plunged deeply. And the commentators always say, into what? Into the greatness of God. So these are poets who plunge into the reality of God and out of the reality of God sing their poetry. Uh, there are about 4,000 verses uh, attributed to the 12 Alvar saints of that time period. They, they were canonized as early as, let's say, the 10th or 11th century. And over the past 1,000 years, many commentaries have been written on them. Uh, they're used in theological discourse. They're chanted in temples, even now, this year. Um, and they're translated in various ways into English and other languages. So it's an old tradition, a living tradition, although it is not as famous by any means as the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads or other Hindu texts that people may have heard of. What you see on the screen there are simply um, we were looking for a good picture to put up, and there were problems with this picture and that picture, is from a particular temple, um, the images, the black Morti stones of a number of these different saints, and then above them, those little name cards, the, their names in Tamil. And I won't bother going through this because it's not relevant. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it afterwards. But the, the saint we're looking at, Turu um, uh, Poigai Alvar, uh, Bhut Alvar, Pei Alvar, and then several other saints, their names are given there. And then below the name are the images of the saints, such as you would find in the temples of those particular saints. And so we often only have hagiographical information about these saints. We know very little about them in terms of historical data. They're always connected with a specific body of poetry. And the one saint that I'm going to uh, look into tonight uh, will be the one who actually wrote by tradition, the first 100 verses of this collection of 4,000 verses, Poigai Alvar. The, name, the word Poigai means a well or a cistern. And the hagiographical tradition is that he was born in a cistern and out of the cistern came forward singing songs. Um, there are other myths about the poetry which are quite beautiful. But what I've been trying to do in translating the first four of these saints, so about 600 verses, from the first four of these Alvar saints, is trying to, first of all, do a, a good translation. And I put the translation of the first verse of the first song up here on the screen. Trying to translate it. And um, Tamil is not my native language. Everyone who studies Tamil, except for native Tamil speakers, know Tamil is a very difficult language. Uh, even native Tamil speakers find this old poetry difficult. But part of it is the work, the hard work, of learning to translate the poetry. And that's what I've been trying to do over the past year or so, getting into this poetry to prepare a translation. Translating the poetry, knowing the grammar, knowing the vocabulary and the like, and then making it make some sense in the English language. I mean, it could be French, it could be Arabic, it could be any language. But making it make sense and also have some spiritual resonance in a new language so that it communicates not simply, I got all the words straight from the dictionary, but rather to be able to communicate across the boundaries by using the words in a new way. And then having some resonance that's intellectual but also spiritual. Uh, my great hope with um, translating the 600 verses that I'm working on would be that it'd be kind of like a Psalter or a prayer book that could be used by people in, of the South Indian Hindu traditions who would appreciate an English translation. Some younger people uh, are less sure about their medieval Tamil but also for people in the room and online who are not Hindu, uh, to be able to see these texts as speaking to us spiritually over the generations. 
And so I give you the first verse here, and I'll read you the first uh, two just to get us started, and then to begin to talk about what we can do with these verses. Earth, the lamp's bowl. Ocean, the melted butter. Fiery sun, the flame. With this lamp, by this garland of words, I honor the feet of him who holds the bright flaming discus. I cry, may we dry up our ocean of sorrows. So in a very beautiful way, the poet sees the entire world as like this lamp with the rising sun as a lamp to be held up to offer an arati, as they say in the temple, in the presence of the deity. And my words become part of that offering, he says, as I begin to sing my songs so that the Lord can somehow reach and pull me out of my sorrows and dry up the ocean of samsara. And he begins with that simple term. The second one, which I'll read you just uh, another one, gets very specific. And I think one of the points I'll be making is that people don't, we don't resonate with these stories. We don't know these stories, and they're often puzzling to us. When did you churn the ocean, Lord? When you accepted the water that was offered to you, what world did you get? I have no idea. You bridged the ocean, broke the bridge, slept again on the ocean. You created the world, plowed it, ate it, put it forth again. Very specific stories in mythology that's being evoked. But the point of it really is at the beginning, I know these things about you, O Lord, and I do not know who you are. I don't understand you. And I think we should be able to resonate with language like that, resonate with it across religious boundaries, that in the Psalms and in mystical texts of other traditions, there is a sense of knowing what God has done and knowing who God is and saying, I don't understand any of this. By one stride, the measure of the whole world. By a second stride, the measure of the waters surrounding the earth. As for that demon so cruel in form, Lord, you got her measure too. But still, I cannot measure your ways. I cannot comprehend you. So it's a beautiful first verse that I have there on the screen, and I'll just keep going. But I'd be happy to talk afterwards and be on email with people and maybe in the Q&A about uh, the deeper meaning of this poetry. The reason I work on poetry, I'll, I'll say before moving on to the next um, set of texts, would be say that poetry is utterly demanding because it's so particular. Um, if somebody says, here's my poem, and you say, I, I don't have time to read it, just tell me what it's about that can be really disheartening for the poet. And many poets, I've been to poetry readings, I'm sure you have too, the meaning of the poetry is the reading of the poetry, the hearing of the poetry, not the label or the summary of it or the abstract you find online or something like that. Read the poetry, hear it, think about it. Uh, the famous uh, poet T.S. Eliot, in one of his essays about poetry, says there's an utter kind of compelling, demanding, absolute nature to poetry that refuses to be replaced by anything else. You either get the words of the poetry or you fail altogether. Prose, he said, rightly or wrongly, you can fool around with, you can summarize, you can replace this with that, but poetry is utterly particularly demanding. And the reason I like, therefore, working with poetry is that the poetry, in some sense, brings to us absolute religious realities in verbal form that just as you can't erase the particularity of the poetry, nonetheless, you can begin to try to put it in another language without erasing the particularity. There are things about this verse and the next verses that I read that cannot really be understood except by going back to them and thinking about them and praying about them again and again. And I would argue that when we talk about, as I did last night, about interfaith, is that interfaith is not simply interreligious or historical study, but is rather going deeper into it and figuring out how to translate. So translating, knowing your own language, learning the language that is not your mother tongue, finding approximations in your language of what is found in the other language, bringing these things together, putting it forth as I've tried to do with this verse in English language, and then, if you're an honest about it, saying, a total failure, it didn't work, the original sounds much better, it's beautiful, it can be sung, it's a failure, but I will keep doing it because we have no alternative but to use the words we have. Uh, finding words in English for Tamil words, or Chinese words, or Arabic words, or Hebrew words, whatever. We keep trying to do this. 
And I think this could be a metaphor. I'm talking about translations that I do. But one could also talk about all the things that everyone here in the room and everyone online does in terms of interfaith work, liturgy, ritual practice, music, dance, art, uh, social activity for justice, conversations, all kinds of ways that we engage in the particular that from the outside may look and say, well, that's such a local event. That's so unimportant on the global scene. But it's not. It is important. It is not insignificant. And I think what I'm talking about translation, keep talking, you know, thinking in your own mind about translating from where you are, what you do in particular, into terms that somehow have a power to them that I would say help us to, over, to restore religious language. And doing this again, and this came up last night uh, as well, I do it again as a Roman Catholic, a practicing Roman Catholic, and I think it helps to be rooted in a tradition so as to be able to understand another tradition better, to go to the other tradition, to enter upon it into particularity. So growing up Catholic, studying Catholic theology, being a priest in the Catholic Church, Jesuit, uh, going to the parish and saying Mass on Sundays, celebrating the liturgical year, Holy Week and Easter, coinciding this year with Passover during Ramadan. All of these things are part of the rich sense of religiosity that I have, that none of which is directly related to Tamil poetry from the ninth century. But I think it gives me a starting point in my particularity to engage the particularity of the other. And so when I come now to the next slide, what I'd like to do is start to play with the poetry that I'm putting before you and just showing you examples of where we go. So I did to be even more arbitrary, instead of the first verses, I picked three verses from the middle of the hundred verses of this saint. Apart from those who winnow down their many bodies to a single body, as if to a single ape flower seed, in their striving to see our primal Lord, whose tall top knot and bright crown are radiant like fresh bright flowers, everyone else finds him too hard to see. And what the poet is still struggling with here in the middle of his work at verse 49 is saying that God is visible. We all know that the Lord has a tall top knot of hair. He wears a brilliant crown. He radiates the freshness of flowers. I know that conceptually, but only if I winnow down my many bodies to one body. And that could mean reincarnations, coming down to your last reincarnation. Or it could mean, out of all the material, complicated, distracted realities of who we are, focusing to one. As apparently in medieval counting systems, you had these ape flower seeds, and you'd line them up for children. You know, count them, there are 10. Count them, there are 15. Count them, there are three. Count it, there's only one. Narrow it down, and you get to one. Contrasting with other people who find him too hard to see because they have not done the narrowing and the focusing work that is needed to go forward. Now, when I take a verse like this, there's a kind of struggle that is involved. And for me, as a comparativist, I begin to make peculiar um, comparisons. And I'll, I'll, again, I have to do all this fi fi uh, quickly because I have a lot to, to do in a short time. So I take the same verse here and thinking of, inter of religious struggle uh, struggling to make your many bodies one, struggling to see the Lord. And yet, for my mind, again, a very peculiar mind, you might say, one of the passages that came to me right away was from Genesis 32. And I'll just read, maybe I'll just read part of this for you. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his maids, his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything he had, he left all of that aside. He stayed there, he was left alone, but a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, the angel said, let me go, day is breaking. I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he asks his name and he gives them a blessing. You shall be called Israel, for you have striven with God and humans and have prevailed. And Jacob said, tell me your name. Why is it you ask my name? And he blessed him. And Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. 
Now, on one level, and I'd be the first to admit it, these two passages I put together really don't fit together. Different traditions, different backgrounds, different histories, different languages. But the idea of the struggle, the idea of the few who are chosen, not those on the other side of the river, but those who begin to understand and struggle coming to a conclusion, it is possible to see God if you struggle and give up everything else. And why this is important for me, before I move on to the next one, would be simply to say that it gives me a place in my home tradition to begin to receive this Tamil poetry. So the Tamil poetry, again, is foreign. I've been studying it on and off for many years. But it's still foreign. But when I think of, well, this verse reminds me of Jacob and the angel. It begins to say there's a connection. I might a year from now say, no, that was not a good connection. Let's have another one. I'll give you other examples. You begin to link and make things connections between what you've done and what's possible. Another one, the next verse, verse 50. If you master your five unruly senses and approach him, the Lord, with flowers piously chosen, you will easily see him receiving water poured into his delicate hands by great King Bali perched on his throne. Now again, the point part of this is we don't mostly know this story. What is the poet talking about? And you can learn this by Googling. Uh, you can learn it by reading me learned medieval commentaries. But again, there's this emphasis on mastering the senses, a certain kind of simple piety, picking the freshest flowers from the bush and bringing them to the Lord. And you'll see him, this time not with a top knot and not wearing a garland and a crown and so on, but as, the, as we find out, the dwarf, the small figure who comes to King Bali, this great king ironically perched on his throne thinking I am the greatest, asking, oh, King Bali, give me three steps of land. And the king says, you're nothing. You're just a dwarf. I give you three steps of land. And part of the giving is to pour water into the recipient's hands. And I'll show you pictures in a moment. And he does this. And some of you will know this very well. At that point, it turns out Vamana, the dwarf, is actually Vishnu, Lord of the universe. And so he begins to grow. And his first step covers the earth. And his second step covers the sky. And then he looks way down back at little Bali and says, where shall I put my third step? You promised me three. And Bali says in one version, you are the Lord. Put your foot upon my head. I become your servant. So for any medieval Tamil, this would resonate perfectly. And what I was trying to do then is um, I'll give you some pictures of it first so you can enjoy um, various scenes from um, different ages, different periods in Indian artistic history. You can see on the right side uh, the king, Bali, and then the dwarf always carrying an umbrella as a kind of renunciant small figure. Here again with one of the gods standing behind Bali, urging him to do this, knowing what will happen, that he'll eventually surrender his throne entirely. And you can appreciate this. You can see, you know, if you get into comparative art, um, you can begin to see that the figures are different colors, and they're different shapes, and there are different figures in them. But I think that's part of the comparative process. You start with the poetry, and you open up this period of visualization. And here is um, when he's growing. And again, this is the larger Vishnu now spreading across the universe. Uh, the gods are there, the, the, cr the creator god with the four faces at the bottom, uh, Brahma. And then on the right side of the screen, the king, who is now a devotee of Vishnu. And I think you know, if you think of this in parallel, let's say go to a museum, the medieval section of a museum that specializes in Christian medieval art, you see hundreds of representations of the, the birth of Jesus, or the Annunciation, or the death of Jesus, or the multiplication of loaves and fishes. And I think part of it is to allow the imagination to spread in your one's own tradition, and then in the other tradition, and then realize that we're all doing the same thing. We start with certain sacred texts, and we begin to imagine and retell our stories. And then you start doing further comparisons. And again, you may conclude at this point that I'm actually going insane or something like that with the crazy comparisons I come up with. So you have the same verse in the left-hand side, mastering the senses, approaching with flowers. And I was thinking what was parallel here 
for me jumps out at this point, there are many parallels you could draw, is the, the water being poured. And the scene on the, the right side, which I will not read this time, is John the Baptist standing with Jesus pouring the water, baptizing Jesus. And this is a kind of a material analogy. The one pouring reminds one of the other pouring. And I do have an image of this. And I love to do this kind of thing. Um, students, I drive crazy sometimes with this. Um, but I think you, know, you, you learn from the poetry. You begin to think and say, well, just as the king who is no longer king pours the water into the hands of the swelled dwarf, who turns out to be the lord of the universe, John the Baptist, who's not an evil king, Bali, but nonetheless says to Jesus, you know, who am I to baptize you? And then suddenly, you know, the, the voice from heaven and the, the dove coming down, the spirit, suddenly you realize who Jesus is. And somehow in the act of humility, of being small and insignificant, something much larger opens. And what I would recommend doing, or I try to do myself, is how do you learn interreligiously? You take something as incidental or accidental as a comparison like this, you put together these two images, and you look at them every day. And then you read the, the Tamil verse. Then you read the passage from the Gospel according to Matthew or some other text that it reminds you of, the poetry, something else. It doesn't have to be Matthew. And you begin to think back and forth. And the thing is that your terminology of God, what do we mean by the word God, is now being expanded by new words, new stories, new images that you didn't have before. And I think we all have to go through this educational process, being patient with saying, we have so much to learn. We don't really know where we are or what we're talking about yet. Uh, one more verse, and I'll do it quickly because I do have a lot to do in 15 minutes to do it. Um, 51, again, chosen arbitrarily. It's just 49, 50, 51. If we had all night, I could do 52 and 53, but we don't. That I might see his feet clearly, my heart became clear, and he became completely clear to me. Battling that demon soiled by pride, the Lord became a lion. So please, just count up his names. And again, most of us don't know, what do you mean the Lord became a lion? The evil demon, uh, Hiranyakashipu, is persecuting his son, the devotee, Pralada. Very famous story in Indian devotional tradition. And at one point, the father says to his son, you are wasting your time. There is no point to this. The God you believe in doesn't even exist. He doesn't exist any more than this pillar here. And he pounds on the pillar. And suddenly the pillar opens up and this man lion comes forth and Hiranyakashipu knows he's in trouble. He had had a promise from the gods to say that neither man nor beast could ever kill him. So he's pretty safe. When the man beast, man lion comes forward, he is in deep trouble. And so the conclusion piously in the verses say, therefore count up the names of the Lord. You know, this deed, that deed, other deeds he's done, count them all up and see what they lead you to. But then I have a, a pictures for this, and this is more just for um, filling our mind visually. Um, many scenes like this, you can see on the left side of the scene, it's maybe, I hope it's clear from where you're sitting, um, or online, uh, the, the pillar breaking open. And he's pounded the pillar, and suddenly out of the pillar, this ferocious figure comes, one of the more ferocious avatars of Vishnu to tear him apart, and the little figure over on the very far right of the screen is the boy, Prahlada, the devotee. But somehow the, the saint in his imagination is saying, if we think about this, and if you come with piety, if you come with a certain sense of devotion, if you become clear, the Lord will become clear to you, just as that pillar broke open and the Lord became clear, loving to Prahlada, and terrifying to his father. Another image, a much more tame image, but it was so unusual, I thought I would include this one as well. Now, from there, uh, one can head in other directions. And what we don't have time for, but what I'd like to just suggest is that you can begin to play with much larger bodies of material. So you, you kind of do it like a moon landing. You land in one particular place, and you get there in medieval Tamil India, and you find a verse you like, and you translate the verse, and then you realize there are other verses. So this is a verse from one of the other medieval saints, 
um, who is a figure of the tradition, uh, the fourth of the traditional saints, who puts forward in his writing a much more mystical intimacy with the Lord. And this too is, it's not the same as the first poet because the poets are not all saying the same thing, but you begin to think about what this poet is saying as well. And here you have a, a sense of, sorry, I gotta find my page here, of a union that is quite striking and by some standards a little bit blasphemous perhaps. Today and tomorrow and then a little longer, your grace is all I have. Surely without you I am not. But see Narayana, without me you are not. In this profound sense of the interrelationship, the mutual dependence of the Lord and the saint on one another becomes extremely crucial. And this fascinated me because many of the translators change it and say, without you, I cannot survive, or without me, you know, I need you, you need me because you love me and you care for me, ways of rationalizing it. But all it says, I think I tried to get as literal as possible, Narayana, without me, you are not. And I think this is the, a, a step further than the, the earlier verses I gave you, because I think it opens up kind of a non-dualism that also is of great interest. And this pushed me to do a comparison with Meister Eckhart, of all people, um, saying, let's go mystical, and let's read a mystical tradition of the West. So the Lord and the saint do not exist without one another, and that can be theologized in the commentaries in many different ways. But when you read here about Meister Eckhart, it's not the same thing. It's a different language, a different period. It's in prose. While I yet stood in my first cause, I had no God. I was my own cause. Then I wanted nothing, desired nothing, for I was bare being, the knower of myself and the enjoyment of truth. For before there were creatures, God was not God. He was that which he was. But when creatures came into existence and received their created being, God was not God in himself, he was God in creatures. And while it might be a distortion, medievalists might be shocked to say you're, you're distorting Meister Eckhart, in a sense of saying God is not God except in creatures. God is not God except in these relationships with loving beings in the world is not entirely different from what the Tamil saint is saying. And then the bonus in terms of my larger project here, and I'll keep moving, is to say that in this context, what we're beginning to do is enrich our vocabulary of God across religious boundaries. And so no longer we're simply talking about the word God and do Hindus use the word God and the English word God work for Indian words for God and then other languages, but it's now filled with images, it's filled with stories, it's filled with parallels. And you can at any point say with any of these parallels, including this one, it, it doesn't work ultimately. This isn't right, this isn't full. But nonetheless, I think it forces us to think differently. And if you can do this with Hindu and Christian, you can do it uh, Jewish and Muslim, you can do it Buddhist and Muslim, you can do it Jewish, Jewish and Taoist, you can do it, all these different boundaries can be crossed, written and oral text and so on like that. And I think the opening up and educating of our mind is what's at stake. What I might add to this, um, and I'm almost done now, would be to say one of the problems we have when we begin is that we know each other's traditions only in general and not in the particular. And particularly this expert audience in the room and online are people who've dedicated their lives to this back and forth. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't mean to trivialize what people do know, which is often fantastically impressive. But often it's the traditions and the words of our own tradition that resonate with us. And the stories and memories of the other tradition don't resonate with us. I was uh, thinking for another purpose of, uh, for instance, this passage from Psalm 78. The Ephraimites, armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant. They refused to walk according to his law. In the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels for them in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea, he let them pass through it, and the waters stand like a heap. In daytime, he led them by the cloud, at night with a long, fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness. He gave them water to drink as from the deep. Most of us will know <coughs> all these references to the Pentateuch and the book of Exodus. But when we know those resonances, 
those incredibly deepen and complexify and enrich what we hear when we hear the psalm. And how do we get to the point with other people's religious traditions, we pick up the references, we know the stories, we know where things begin, we know where things end. And I think even from this small example, when you hear somebody saying, oh, he is like Vamana the dwarf, maybe some clicking image from what I showed you in the poetry I read, or he's like the man lion, or he wears a top knot and he has a crown, some of the words and images begin to play in your mind alongside images that might be Jewish or Christian or other traditions. And I think this is what we all need to be doing, among a billion other things, is enriching our vocabulary, our poetry, our imagery across religious boundaries, so that we are truly interfaith, religiously educated, and that we then have something substantive to reflect on interreligiously in terms of academic work and the like. I give you one more, and then I will almost be done. One can go further and see that in the Indian context, there are cases where the, the imagery of God begins to disappear altogether. And this is another medieval poet, um, a text uh, that is um, uh, Kaivalya Navanita, which translate fairly literally the cream of utter simplicity, uh, the, the, the butter that is drawn to make cream, uh, Tandavaraya Swami. By his grace, I came to realize I am entirely Brahman. This whole wide world is but a fiction. I am like air caught in a small space. That true self is truly, is how I truly am. Daily, daily I reverence my teacher's lotus feet. I am like the air in a cup or something. You shatter the cup and the air becomes all air again. Things are opened up. I realize that the world is not real. The fact that I am the ultimate reality is real. Therefore, I bow down and touch my teacher's feet. The God language disappears here. In similar poetry, similar Tamil poetry, like to the ones I've been reading to you. And I think, again, that <clears throat> means to us that we, we can't take our traditions, other people's traditions, and say, OK, I got it now. I know what the Hindus believe. I know what the Buddhists believe. I know what the Jews believe. I know what the Catholics believe. We never do know. But we can keep educating and moving our imagery forward. And, and learning these things and filling them in. And what I'm, I'm trying to say as I come to conclusion is that we have a lot of this work to do among the thousand other things that the Institute does and we all do in our different endeavors and in our institutions of learning and in congregations and temples and parishes and so on. One of the things we need to do is this kind of interreligious education, not in general terms courtesies toward the other, which are very important, but rather, again, to fill our minds with the words, as I said, kind of a prayer book from other religious traditions, the images, the resonances, the stories, and all that, that can begin to fill in for us, so that just as for many of us, the psalm resonates with all the stories we've known from childhood, from Exodus, and similar books, then the poetry of Tamil South India begins to resonate in our mind too. What do you do with that? What kind of theology of God comes out of it? Well, that's a big question. That's for another lecture, unless Shuba solves all those problems in her talk. Um, but for another day. But then there's actually something where theology is interesting again, because it's complexified. It's spilled across the borders of different traditions. To conclude, um, I, I try to make this go on for myself. I read these texts, I read mantras, I use mantras in my prayer and so on like that, all these things I do. One of the things I do um, is have a very beautiful office. If you come to Cambridge Mass, I'll show you my office. Deliberately eclectic of all kinds of imagery of Catholic tradition, Hindu tradition, um, Buddhist tradition, missionaries, other figures. And it's just there. And when students come in my office, they see all this. And they sometimes ask me what it means. And I says, it's what you see. But it, it reminds me every day of the complexity, the visual complexity, as the books on the shelves remind me of the intellectual complexity and so on. And I think we need ways of doing this for ourselves as individuals, as I do. And I'll leave that slide there for a moment. But that we all need to do this individually. And my question to you is, how are you doing it individually? How do you kind of imagine and learn across religious boundaries? And I'm sure you do. It's just a matter of, of sharing the stories with one another. But also as, com as communities, 
How do we go deeper in and celebrate the liturgical year of our own traditions? How do we celebrate our feasts, our sacred days, but also allow the other traditions to, in, to intrude? And so we were graced a few weeks ago by the you know, coming together of Ramadan and Passover and Holy Week Easter. Well, it turns out that Holy Thursday, or the first full day of Passover, was also uh, Hanuman Jayanti, uh, the, the, the celebration of the day of Hanuman, the monkey god in India. And I was getting congratulations from Hindus, or felicitations about uh, Hanuman's day. Blessed be Lord Hanuman. And, and to not clip this out and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to church now, or I'm going to temple now, I can't think of any of that. But to allow these images to kind of flow in us. And, and we have to have our traditions. We have to have Passover. We have to have Ramadan. We have to have Holy Week. But we don't have to have them in purity or isolation. And the clarity that the poet says, I become clear and the Lord becomes clear, I don't think that means exclusion of the other. But I think a purity of heart as you engage the other. So we need to do that in our own traditions. We need, and I, I'm sure this is done a lot through the Institute and, and related organizations, um, ways of learning and praying and imagining together across our religious boundaries. So having well-intentioned good meetings is important, but taking the time to learn, to hear the Quran, to, to read Tamil poetry together, to read Meister Eckhart together, uh, to read the Gospels, to see images of Vamana receiving the water from King Bali, along with John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. All of this somehow has to you know, intrude upon our interreligious gatherings, lest they be too intellectual or too academic. We need like a, you know, five senses, spiritual senses, all of this has to implode. And then we need to go back to our academic communities, you know, where I was talking last night, secondarily interreligious follows upon interfaith, and say to the, our, my colleagues, including myself, my many friends at the AAR and so on like that, this is what we need to be talking about. What are we doing when our traditions mix together and mingle? How do we imagine and think about these things together? Don't please, don't just talk about whether religion refers to anything, the word religion. Or don't ask whether the word God refers to anything. Or don't talk about whether religions are now all dissolving into culture and society and so on. But take the things that we experience on the ground in the work we do and the study we do and allow that to become the substance of conversations among scholars as well. Because people of faith need scholars but scholars will have nothing much to talk about if they're scholars of religion unless they're listening to people of faith. So I think all of this is incredibly important and there are incredible possibilities. And the last thing I would say, and this is really is the last thing of the last things I said, uh, would be, and then we need to go, as last night we talked, to people who are spiritual but not religious, people who don't identify with, you know, so I didn't grow up with Psalm 78, or I didn't grow up with Tamil poetry, or I didn't grow up with Meister Eckhart, or this or that. I didn't mark Ramadan or Passover. How do we talk to people who are, have not been gifted with or receiving that kind of solidity? And then how do we kind of bridge the gap? How do we translate? As I'm translating Tamil poetry, how do we translate what we're talking about through words, through sentences, through stories, through poetry, through images, so that people can understand. And then back to Pannenberg, as I close my folder. There are people in this world, as he says, reminds us from Rahner, who it's just a blank thing. I have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about God. How do we go from the rich possibilities of the kind of thing that we know from our traditions to being able to show people, this is what we're talking about, don't you see? that if you narrow your focus and if you clarify your mind, you can come to know what we're talking about because the secular is actually less important than the religious. And we need to flip the story. It's not that the world is becoming more secular, but the religiousness of the world is being obscured by certain kinds of secular conversations. And I think we need to be the people to reverse that and allow the infinite possibilities of our traditions to reopen. And with that happy note, I'll stop. Thank you.
Thank you so much. We're going to take a two-minute break to set up for uh, Q&A. And uh, I just want to remind you all that all questions from our online audience and our in-person audience can be asked using the app called Slido. And you don't need to download the app. Just go to slido.com and enter in today's program number, which is 3034530. There's already a lot of great questions that are coming in, and we look forward to hearing uh, Professor Clooney's answers. So again, we'll join us back here in two minutes. Good afternoon and welcome back. Um, we're going to have about 20 minutes of, of Q&A with Professor Clooney, and there's a lot of wonderful questions that are coming in, and so I'm excited to, to get the conversation going. Um, I think we, there's just wonderful questions around translation, which your, your presentation um, brought out in the audience. And so let's just dive right in um, with Paul Ricoeur. I think that's a good place to start here. Um, so Paul Ricoeur sees translation as linguistic hospitality. The translator is both host and guest. How do you understand translations of Hindu poetry, your role? How do you situate yourself in those roles of host and guest? Paul Ricoeur is a deep topic. Um, I, I think I would, I would say, I mean, in terms of you know, giving a brief answer, because we want to get as many questions in in the short time we have, is that um, one is, as, as um, the theologian Terence Merrigan pointed out at Leuven not that long ago, you know, we're treading on sacred ground when we begin to learn from other people's traditions. Um, like Moses on the mountain, we have to cast off our sandals, and we have to be there with a certain humility and a sense of um, we're guests. And so that's the beginning of it. I, I, you know, the idea of like, you know, just barging in on medieval Tamil poetry that is still recited today and saying, oh, yes, that's all mine now. No, it, it's, a, it's a gift. It's a hard work that learning the language and so on. But it's a privilege and not something to be taken for granted. I haven't owned it just because I bought the book and so on like that. And on the other hand, I think, um, you know, either through living persons from the other religious tradition who come to explain the poetry, or by, in a sense, inviting the poetry of Tamil South India into English, I then become responsible as a host for the respectful reception of that poetry, that it be at home, that it have a, an environment appropriate to the poetry, not simply entirely taken out of context and stuck on a museum shelf or something like that. <coughs> And that's what I was trying to say about you know, the idea of a psalter, like making a prayer book out of this poetry would seem to be more respectful of what it is when it's back home. So I like that imagery. I'm not sure what I, more I can say in the moment. Uh, we could talk about it later. But the idea that it's all a gift, it's all a matter of respect and humility, and that one has obligations if one is a translator to respect the living tradition from which the other comes and not forget about that starting point. Um, picking up on your, your reference to the Psalter, um, there's a question here around um, comparison again and, and how form and content relate to one another. So the, the juxtapositions you put out today, there's poetic and then um, prose. And a, a question coming from the audience would be um, comparing the Hindu poetry that you have to the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And could you talk about that? I think um, when one begins to make a comparison, um, uh, if one doesn't want to be entirely paralyzed by the possibility that every comparison has infinite, you know, which two do you put together, then I think it's perfectly notice noticeable and fair to notice, well, one was in poetry and the other was in prose. Um, and the structures of Tamil and Hebrew are different. And therefore, I was picking out a certain kind of thematic sense of the struggle and the idea that only a few are elected to be able to see God. That's what I was playing with. But then I think, as I you know, quoted from Psalm 78 and, and the memories there that many people don't share, then I think one can move to a different kind of comparison. I don't know Hebrew, <clears throat> but I've learned a lot from the translations of Robert Alter. Mm -hmm. And Robert Alter is um, like his beautiful translation of the Psalms. And in his introduction to that translation, he talks at length about 
how the struggle to translate that poetry and to bring it to life in the English language, as, as not knowing Hebrew, I think he beautifully does. Um, then to say, well, then if you read the Tamil and the Psalms together, because of this challenge to create a Psalter, then I think that opens up another set of possibilities. I mean, years ago I did a, a book called His Hiding Places Darkness, where I took the Song of Songs and read it with some of the Tamil poetry of the lost of the loved one and so on. But I think there's been so much beautiful work done on the Psalms and the lyric and the way the Psalms work and where theology is in the form of the Psalms, that that can be really helpful in terms of talking about Tamil poetry in English um, and making sense of it in terms of an analog that is also sacred. So I, I, def I think there's some work been done on that, but I think a lot more could be done. You know, so I wasn't saying, you know, oh, no, it has to be Genesis and therefore leave it at that. But once you see the poetry, everyone who has a memory of religious tradition can say, well, I thought of this instead, or I thought of that. And then you can open up other possibilities. And because poetry is really hard to pin down, then when you start you know, reading poetries together, the possibilities you know, multiply infinitely. And then uh, you never stop. Um, this is another question about how you're showing up to the work of translation. Um, is interreligious exploration through translation of Hindu poetry a form of mysticism for you or piety for you um, as well as an intellectual practice? I think yes. Um, I mean, from the start, um, I think, as I alluded to you know, both yesterday and a little bit today, that it, it means a lot to me th that I am in a religious tradition. So I keep repeating, I'm a Catholic, I'm a priest, and so on like that, that um, I live in kind of a mystical environment. I mean, you're not, it doesn't have to be high mysticism, but ordinary mysticism of daily life where the things around us are sacred and the things open up the reality of God. And just like an ordinary, I had the 7.30 mass on Sunday in the parish, an ordinary mass without music on a Sunday morning can suddenly open up sacred realities. Then saying, well, I'm also then reading Tamil poetry, I think it would be a great disappointment to me at least if I then read the poetry kind of tone deaf and said, I am now putting on my Indological hat and my South Asian studies hat, and I'm reading this poetry in terms of you know, the prior poetry that it's related to, and I'm reading it in terms of the syntax of Tamil, and so on like that, and leaving it. That, one has to know all of that. That's absolutely important. But that the same kind of sense of the sacred and the sense of the way in which words, as the poet in the first verse said, my words are part of the offering I make, that the words we read in the other tradition should be, at least by way of analogy, as sacred and spiritual as the words we read in our own tradition. And while pushing that further and saying, well, what's the theology of that? How can you say a text that's not of the Bible is as sacred to you as a text of the Bible? I didn't say that, for one thing. I just said analogously, as you take seriously the sacredness of your own sacred text, you have to bring the same humility, the same openness, the same respect, the same belief that somehow the divine is working, God is working. Otherwise, why are you doing it? Um, and there may be good reasons to be a historian or a linguist, but I think for me, it's part of the dynamic to say, as I treat my own, I so receive and treat the other. Back to this idea of hospitality and the guest and so on like that, it would be rude to expect my tradition to be treated one way and the other tradition in a more like analytic doing an autopsy or something like that. No, it's a, it's a living sacred reality. So building off of that, um, this is a question from our online audience. Um, Catholic theologian Paul Knitter writes that for him, Jesus and the Buddha both come first. How does sort of a dual theological identity f inform in a religious dialogue? So I, th I think Paul Nitter, who's a, a friend of mine for many, many years, I have great respect for Paul. And um, even now, at a venerable age, he's still writing and traveling and uh, you know, doing so many fascinating, fast fantastic things in his writing and teaching and so on like that. I think he and I have always differed on how we talk about what we do. Um, early on, some of his work about pluralism, 
uh, working with John Hick on work about being a pluralist, seeing the many paths going up the mountain and so forth like that, that there's a way that which some of his early work before he had studied in depth the Buddhist traditions where he took initiation and then coming to statements like this, both the Buddha and Christ are first, I think was a certain kind of um, you know, solution that's quite honorable and quite lived in his long life of probing these realities. But I could never say that. I think while it may seem that that's what I'm doing, you know, Tamil poetry and the Psalms come first. I think what for me is, again, the grounding in the specificity of my own religious tradition, that I'm a companion of Jesus, the Jesuits are the Society of Jesus, I'm a companion of Jesus, that is the ultimate demanding reality that is first in my life, first and last in my life. But what perhaps makes me different from some people who say things like that is I don't see that as a bar at all to learning into religiously, to going into temples and realizing the sacred places and reading the poetry in a prayerful fashion. That the Jesus of whom I am a companion, who is the way, the truth, and the life, somehow honors and gives credibility to everything that is true and everything that is alive and everything that is on the way to God, everything that is beautiful. So what difference does it make? Are we just playing you know, academic word games? The Buddha and Christ are first. Nidra will say that. Cluny won't say that um, you know, Vishnu and Christ are first. I think is a different resonance to it. And I think we both and all of us have to be respectful. How far can we go and how we say these things? And what are we willing to say? And for me, it's also partly, you know, I'm in a religious order. The eyes of the Vatican are on us at all times. Um, I'm a priest at the altar. And, and to be credible there, I don't want to betray the, the piety of the people who come to church. And I don't want to seem to be a Catholic priest there and then be sort of a Hindu Catholic other days of the week. And I think it's, it's a fine distinction. But I think how we talk about what we do often is, is, is very important and liberating. So I wouldn't say that. I respect Paul for saying it. But I think he and I, at a different level, disagree because he more the pluralist path, as I say, not an inclusivist, but including the other in my Catholic reality has a certain power to it, a sacramental reality that doesn't get theorized in terms of pluralism, but nonetheless has a power to it. To, to, to talk about sort of boundaries and borders and sort of when, um, when do you say no? I would say that the examples that you gave us today are moments where you found resonance within Hindu tradition. Can you give an example of a moment where you couldn't find that sort of spiritual resonance or the, the translation became more of an intellectual project and less of a mystical project? Maybe another way to ask the question. Well, there are different kinds of, of no. I mean, so early at work, my dissertation work was in an arcane field that I give a different lecture on on a different night called Mimamsa. And the Mimamsa is like ancient Indian ritual law. And it's a way of, of thinking religiously about law, how the law of the rituals work, precedence of laws in relationship to one another, how texts are to be read and practiced, and so on. That even the Indian tradition has found very, very hard to deal with devotionally. Um, one of my teachers years ago told me, if you study this Mimamsa ritual theory too long, your heart will dry up. Um, your heart will wither within you. So certain things, uh, no, because it's not that kind of material. Or Indian logic, Nyaya. Or certain kinds of Vedanta texts that are strictly apologetics. They're not meant to be devotional, just as oh, there are so many Christian writings that are not meant to be devotional. I think the other kind of no, and this may be what the, the question is also asking, is do you come to something that you find perhaps objectionable or, or deeply unsettling? And on one level, I gave the example last night of the temple in Dakshin Kali, going there and, and seeing animal sacrifice. And you would think that that would have turned me off, being a vegetarian and so on. But it didn't. And that was, had to do with sacramentality and so on. I mean, I think the easiest way is to say, well, social abuses and social outrages. Um, so the oppression of certain people, the exclusion of some, the dehumanization of people at the bottom of the pile. Um, in, in traditions, the 
awful language sometimes that's used about women and the exclusion of women from power um, or sharing of power. There are things that you know, I don't want to go there, but I think my role is like the, the host. When Hindu traditions visit the Christian and the Western world, is to not do the disservice to the person who's been invited in by taking them only at their worst. So if one takes, for instance, the example of the caste system, and there, there are all kinds of abominations one can read in the papers about killings related to caste, and some of the texts are awful in the way that you know, the lowest caste are talked about. I, I think it would be a disservice to say, and caste reduces to the worst aspects of caste, and the worst aspects of caste are what we need to know about Hinduism. That's not at all true. And there are all kinds of ways in which caste structures also hold society together. They also enable people to live good lives. And I'm not you know, arguing there should be more caste, but nonetheless, there are ways in which I think we're responsible that our no is qualified, and that our no is not an absolute no because you have outraged me on this, therefore I'll have nothing to do with you. There may be groups in society who can think of that, that they're really outrageous and you just say no. But I, I would say that's because I think of the same about my Roman Catholic tradition. There are a number of things that people say no to in the Catholic Church, and there are outrages in the Catholic tradition, ancient and in the past few years. And there are many people who have walked away from the church and said, no more, I'll have nothing to do with the Catholic Church. I would say that my job is not to pretend those awful things haven't happened or don't exist, but rather to say my job is also to esteem the good of Catholic tradition and to try to say that the sins we commit and the sins sometimes of our leaders don't define who we are. If I can say that about Catholic, how could I not say that about Hindu? So I think there are no's in buried in what I do. I tend to look for things that say yes, because I think we need more yes at this point. But the things that I would say no to are, are rarely going to be absolute no's, therefore I'll have nothing more to do with you. I, I believe there's very little of that in what I study. I think we have time for one, one more question. Um, and I, I think that this is an interesting one, again, that goes to, to method. Um, there's a question about C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia that I want to bring up. Um, <laughs> I, you know, you were, you were talking about sacred text and recognizing the sacrality of text. And I think we've also had conversations around those who are religiously unaffiliated and how they can participate in this type of comparative text study. You can certainly make the argument that the Chronicles are, are a, a form of sacred text, certainly in the Christian tradition of, of a kind, but they are still literature. Um, and someone was the, the, the reference to the lion brought up Aslan for the questioner. Yeah. And so do you find that this work or maybe other works of literature speak across or to interfaith dialogue? I think so. Um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, particularly, you know, C.S. Lewis, uh, as a person who's a renowned Christian writer, uh, who writes very beautifully and is still popular so many years after his death, that when one thinks of, of trying to reimagine the Christian story in terms that are accessible, not just to children, but as they say, children of all ages, who need to be kind of shown the enchantment of the world according to the Christian message, that he's doing that beautifully um, in his writing. And that text speaks to people. Um, I'm a fan more of Tolkien and The Lord of the Rings, which is so kind of, if, if, you're, if you have Christian eyes and you're looking for things, you know, the whole Frodo theme and the Frodo sufferings is a Christ image. And there are all kinds of ways that that resonates and may be able to help people. I was telling somebody yesterday, I think, uh, one summer at HDS about four or five years ago, I was invited to a, a summer, um, you know, kind of spirituality group that was meeting to talk something about Hindu mantras and Hindu prayer. And they, we talked about all that, and it was very nice. And at the end of it, they said, OK, we're going to continue now with the ritual part. And the ritual part was a reading from Harry Potter, followed by chanting certain sentences from Harry Potter. And I stayed for it. It was quite remarkable. Um, so Narnia, a Christian writer. Tolkien, a Christian writer. Um, Potter is a different kind of thing. But I asked the, the organizer, who was actually had been in, involved with campus ministry at our college when she was an undergrad, she said, well, we use this because this is the only thing we have in common. 
It's the only text we've read that evokes reality for us and opens things for us. So I think many times it's practical about what works. And certain kinds of music speak spiritually to people. Um, on a broader level, and, and I have colleagues at Harvard um, who, who work on religion and literature, and say, you know, we close the door to so many sacred possibilities by only dealing with texts that are in canons. You know, is it in the canon? Is it in the testament or not in the testament? I'm sorry, then Shakespeare doesn't count. Emily Dickinson doesn't count. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese, uh, you know, poetry doesn't count. People are saying not, hopefully not saying, let's level it and say there's no difference between literature, poetry, drama, and the sacred text, but that other acts of language are not, if they're not the sacred text, it doesn't mean they're merely secular texts, and that there are all kinds of intermediate realities that I think we can draw on. And I think those of us who are therefore in religious circles, you know, need to be more like C.S. Lewis or Tolkien, and be able to evoke in terms that people can appreciate what the God language is about, so that we don't fall into Rana's trap. We're talking about God all the time, and people say, I have no idea what you're talking about. So tell me a story, show me a movie that I think opens up possibilities. And that's what C.S. Lewis is trying to do. And I guess we have to try the same thing. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions right now, but we'll invite you back um, with Dr. Patak um, yes. a little bit later okay. this afternoon. So we're just gonna take a short coffee break of about five minutes, um, and then we'll have our second lecture for the afternoon.